India is booming. It's joining the elite club of global superpowers. India has it now. India should just to go and pick it up. Within a generation, India's economy will overtake Japan and Western Europe to become the third largest in the world. But underneath this glittering modern surface lie some painful realities. India is a country where tens of millions are born into poverty. India is blooming only for the rich, not for the poor. It's a country where thousands of farmers are committing suicide every year. It's a country where the Hindu right demand a Hindu state. And it's a country where the hierarchy of the caste system still leaves those at the bottom to clear up human excrement. Tonight on Dispatches, is this the price India is prepared to pay to be the world's next superpower? Or will the new India be able to bridge the gap between its winners and losers? Mumbai, India's financial capital and a driving force behind the country's economic miracle. In the 20th century, India was just another struggling third world country. Now its economy is growing at an incredible 9% a year, the second fastest in the world. This is a country with more billionaires than anywhere else in Asia. One of them is Jignesh Shah. India is passing through a very exciting time. Uh, there's a huge economic boom. Uh, you can, uh, in a simple term, you can say that uh, all the international brands are available from uh, Ferrari to Mercedes to private jet. Corporate India is seizing control of businesses around the globe, and Britain is a prime target. Indian tycoons have taken over Britain's steel industry, and they've got everything from whiskey distillers to financial services in their sights. From his offices in Mumbai, Jignesh Shah runs a global operation, creating high-tech ways to do age-old business. In his online exchange, commodities like natural gas, silver and gold are traded electronically. Jignesh has created a $2 billion empire from scratch that's catapulted him into the top 40 of India's rich list. Where would you see yourself in a, in a few years' time? Between Tokyo and London, we will stand as in the number one exchange in that region and connecting the market, bringing the Indian potential to the world. Two billion pounds worth of trading goes on on this exchange every day. No wonder the goddess of wealth is looking on. In the new India, old beliefs endure, and Hinduism, the religion of 80% of the population, goes hand-in-hand hand with the economic miracle. For billionaires like Jignesh Shah, that means regular visits to a Hindu temple to offer prayers to Ganesh, the god of good fortune. It is belief in uh, Hinduism that you start anything with the Ganesh uh, god, it removes all the hurdles. So does it work? Yeah, I think uh, it works. India's economic boom is not based on sweatshops and factories. Hinduism has always placed a premium on acquiring knowledge, and the new India has tapped into this to create a high-skilled economy employing highly qualified graduates. And that's taking this country from the third world to the first in a single generation. India's boom has been knowledge-driven. It's been about information technology, call centres, becoming the world's back office. But it has ambitions beyond all of that. And I'm on my way now to what's very much the new frontier. One of the most important new growth areas is biotechnology. Private research centres like this take their pick of the 200,000 scientists graduating every year. In just five years, this company has become a world leader in the potentially lucrative field of stem cell research. So this is the non-sterile area where you have all the equipments like... The team here are in a race with the best labs in the world 
to produce cures for Parkinson's disease and heart failure. Around the world, there's no embryonic stem cell therapy still available. So I would say that we are one of the leaders in this area. But there's another reason for its rapid success. Using human embryos for this research is highly controversial in the West, where it comes up against religious taboos. But in India, it doesn't offend Hindu sensibilities, seen instead as simply a part of the knowledge economy. Government in India is quite uh, friendly towards uh, embryonic stem cell research. Uh, we really don't have any major concerns as far as uh, stem cell research in India is concerned. Do you ever get protesters outside? No, we don't. Are there any lobby groups trying to shut you down? No, absolutely not, not. This is an industry without the kinds of problems that it has in America. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. When it comes to biotechnology, India is racing ahead, while in America only this month, George Bush vowed to block funding for such research. So once again, India's progress apparently goes hand in hand with its religious conviction. Not only does India escape the kind of moral and ethical debates and controversies plaguing stem cell research in the United States, Hinduism seems to complement the work going on here. India's high-tech, high-skill approach is powering the country's economic success. And not surprisingly, politicians have tried to exploit it. At the last election, the then government went to the polls with the slogan, India Shining. Candidates and spin doctors used this film to present a glowing image of the new India. With the economy booming, the government expected to triumph. But the campaign backfired and they were kicked out of office. Millions of Indians knew that India was shining, but not on them. This is Dharavi, a slum in the centre of Mumbai that's home to more than 700,000 people. Across the city, millions more live in places like this. While many of India's rich are getting richer, many of these people are getting left behind. Anu has lived her whole life on this pavement. Now we are living from here for so many years. Our parents were here, we were born here, we have grown up, we are married, our kids are here. We use the toilet which is inside. Actually, we are not supposed to go, but now we have no other alternatives. And we have one which we pay one rupee and go there. Tell me in which way is India booming? It might be booming for the rich people, they are progressing. The government, I don't know, he's doing something which is only satisfying the rich. But for us, it's the same how it was 25, 30 years back. There's no difference. In the cities, you can't miss the poor. The rich pass by them every day. In rural India, there are millions more in poverty who remain hidden far from sight. Seven hundred million people live in India's countryside. That's almost three quarters of the population. And out here, there's a huge tragedy unfolding. I've traveled nearly 200 miles from the capital, Delhi, to the state of Punjab, supposedly one of the richest agricultural areas in the country. It's so lush out there, you can see why they call Punjab India's breadbasket. And it is one of their great post-independence achievements that the Green Revolution, as they called it in the 1960s, ended famine in India. But these days, that phrase, the breadbasket of India, is starting to feel a little hollow to quite a lot of the farmers on this land. Most farmers only have a couple of acres, yet they've had to buy tractors, expensive fertilizers and irrigation pumps to grow wheat and rice, and that's got them heavily into debt forcing them into the hands of the moneylenders. To break the cycle of debt, farmers were encouraged to grow cash crops like cotton. They were auctioning the last of this year's crop as I arrived. Cotton has turned out to be expensive to produce. In recent years, the crop has failed for many farmers, and with prices at market low, 
debts have simply got worse for people like Baljinder Singh. दूसरे पासे हर एक चीज मतलब जिधे लोन लान चल पे इन्ना नलता डाउन ही होया तकरीबन कोई प्रोग्रेस नहीं की थी तकरीबन मंगे आई ज़्यादे करके हर एक चीज मंगे आई है जी उधे बजाय मतलब फसल दा बहुत कट पैसा बटाय जाना है इससे नल किसान डाउन ही है now, there's a minimum price set by the government for this, but the farmers say it's nowhere near high enough, and they're demanding the government raises it dramatically. But that's not happened. It seems the consumer counts more than the producer. And to add to the farmers' troubles, heavily subsidised American cotton is now flooding the market. Many small farmers have found their debts too much to bear, and that's having disastrous consequences. In several parts of the country, there's been a wave of suicides where farmer after farmer has been unable to see a way out. Every day, individual tragedies are unfolding. The people of this village have come to mourn with two young boys who've just lost both their parents. Two weeks ago, Bahadur Singh set himself on fire after pouring kerosene over his body. His wife, Hajinda, tried to save him, but was set on fire herself in the process. She died in hospital some days later, and this is the 10th day memorial service for her. This is your brother. Bahadur Singh had only two acres. In his efforts to grow cotton, he'd got heavily into debt with local money lenders. How old was he? He was forced to sell his land, losing what little he had. Bahadur Singh ने वो एक दिन जिस दिन खुशी खुशी की है उनका बड़ा लड़का वो पट्टे लेने गए थे ठेके से पशुओं के पास थी उसके बेटे ने बड़े बेटे ने कहा पापा जो जो उसने बांध बेचा है वे पापा ये पेड़ पट लिए तू था वे टोकरे बना लेंगे वो कहना पोत भी ये अपना पेड़ तू तो अपना नहीं रहा है उसके बे उसके जवाब देना औखा हो गया वो घर आकर वो यही सोचता रहा है हमने बच्चों के लिए कुछ भी नहीं छोड़ागा भी हम बच्चे उसे क्या खिलाएंगे बस उसने आंसर मिट्टी का तेल पाया आग लगा दी अब जब जब मेरा डैडी था जब ले आते था था तो अब हम क्या इसके दोषी सरकारें हैं जो भी सरकार आती है वो जिम्मेदार पर ध्यान नहीं देती छोटे छोटे It's not just in Punjab where debt-ridden farmers are killing themselves. Over a 10-year period, more than 100,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide. It's a disaster of epic proportions and one that India has been slow to wake up to. India's economic boom has transformed the nation's cities. They're expanding at a momentous rate. But that's causing thousands to lose their land. Welcome to Gurgaon, a new town on the outskirts of India's capital. This is where you really see the incredible economic growth in India, because just for mile after mile here is all brand new industrial sprawl just outside Delhi. And it's not attractive, but it shows you the kind of wealth that there is here. And if you'd have been here just a couple of years ago, all of this was farmland. And that's the problem. There's a penalty being paid for all of this growth by those who used to work this land and have now been forced out. Uh -huh. Hari Kishan's village is only 25 miles from the centre of Delhi. He's one of hundreds of farmers in this area whose land has been taken over by the government using compulsory purchase laws to make way for more factories. <laughs> If we don't know what we will do and what we will do. He said, I will bank. We will not have the money in the bank. If you have the money in the bank, you will have the money in the bank. As the builders move in, farmers on the edges of India's cities are losing their ancestral livelihoods. 
परेशानी यहाँ हो रही है धन की हो रही है ज्यादा गौ आखिर की सेवा में लाख रहे हैं हम है इन्हें कहाँ बाढ़ांगा भाई बात यह इन्हें बेचारियाँ छोड़ जाएंगा और क्या करांगा बता गौ आखिर जब जमीन गाँव के अंदर नहीं है डाटने की तो फिर छोड़ जाएंगा इन्हें बेचारियाँ और क्या करांगा हाथ जोड़ लेंगे इन तक भाई हम तो गवर्नमेंट ने मार दिया पर कहीं जाओ थारी मर्जी कर और क्या करा हाँ as Hurry took his cows off in search of water, I headed into the center of the village to meet some of the younger men. They'd hoped to get work in the new factories built on the land they used to farm. But that hasn't happened. I took company to the company. There are many local people. There is no place for you. 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 ऐसा रोजगार कि हमने अपना कोई काम कर रखा है या इतना इतना बड़ा एरिया नहीं है वो अभी तो डेवलप की भाई अपना कोई रोजगार धंधा वगैरह करके खोल के बैठ जाए इतनी बड़ी अभी मार्केट यहाँ पे बनी नहीं है भविष्य जो है वो काफ़ी ख़राब है गांव का और यहाँ का कंपनी आने के बाद ज़्यादा ख़राब हुआ है कंपनी नहीं थी उससे पहले हम अच्छे खुश थे मतलब ज़्यादा और वापिस ज़मीन मिल जाए तो काफ़ी बढ़िया इससे तो अच्छा है Thousands of farmers equipped only with traditional skills are struggling to find a place in today's India. And the fear is that's sowing seeds for future conflict. Back in Delhi, I met up with the man who's credited with founding India's Green Revolution in the 1960s. Today, MS Swaminathan fears a different kind of revolution. You must have a policy of government which is pro-pharma, pro-agriculture. Modern industry is not giving them jobs. Mm. Therefore, you have a double bind here in the sense agriculture is the only method of livelihood. Secondly, if agriculture is not supported in the way industrialized countries are doing in a globalized economy with very poor farmers, uh, they can't compete. And they see in the television today very affluent. One section of the community are so affluent they can spend thousands of rupees for one dinner or one marriage cost of the rich people cost so much money, while millions of people are starving, undernourished, and you're not. So I think any society which transgresses from the principle of social equity beyond a point, then you have uh, an explosive situation. There are some people who argue that vast amounts of Indian agriculture is just economically unviable and that a lot of people will have to move away from farming uh, as their main source of income into manufacturing. You want to have a nation of landless labourers? Of 500 million landless labourers, that's what they're recommending, such economists. If they create those 500 million landless labourers, the country will be completely ruined. Huh? It will be a chaos. It will be a social chaos of unimaginable dimension. So just how worried is the Indian government about mass unemployment and rural suicides? While your government has been in power, huge numbers of farmers have committed suicide. How do you reconcile that? Well, I feel distressed uh, beyond words. Um, the problem is there, uh, but there are a host of circumstances why uh, some of these suicides have happened, and I certainly would attribute um, levels of poverty as one of the condition and, and, and agricultural for many people being only subsistence uh, agriculture uh, and not really very uh, well, very much uh, uh, income generating agriculture. And that is what we want to achieve. The man they call the father of the Green Revolution, Mr. Swaminathan, warned me that if you continue with agriculture in the state it is and millions of people end up losing their ancestral livelihoods, you could end up with a revolution. And I can tell you that we shall not let that happen. Indian democracy, the Indian nation state, our constitution and our political system will work together to ensure that we do not have lopsided economic growth and development at the cost of the people's basic ways of life. Small-scale farmers are not the only people who are struggling to find a place in the new India. Many Muslims say that their faces don't fit either. As I was on my way to uncover that story, something unexpected happened, which brought the issue clearly into focus. We've jumped our plans and headed out of town because a few hours ago we heard that the 
main train from Delhi to Lahore in Pakistan was hit by a terrorist attack. Um, there's talk of Muslim militants and, uh, and dozens of deaths reported. So we're, we're heading out to see what's actually happened. Trains have become popular targets for terrorist attacks in India, often rooted in the tensions between India and Pakistan. For the 30 years it has linked the two countries, this train has been a symbol of hope for both sides, making its destruction all the more devastating. The fire is believed to have been started with suitcase bombs. I mean, just imagine this carriage jam-packed with people in total panic. You can't get out because there's bars on the windows. You can't get out of the door because the doors are locked. The thing you have to remember is that it is so hard to get permission to go from Pakistan to India or vice versa that the people on this train would have been making literally a once-in-a-lifetime journey. They wouldn't have been able to do this uh, under normal circumstances and this is where their journey's ended. At the nearby hospital, 65 bodies are awaiting burial, many of them badly charred. Bags of ice are being used to keep them preserved in the hope that relatives can identify them. Who is she? Pakistan Lahore most Indians blame these attacks on a Muslim minority supported by Pakistani groups opposed to the peace process. But it's India's mainstream Muslims who face the backlash. There have long been tensions between Hindus and Muslims, at times erupting into communal violence. Five years ago, the state of Gujarat was hit by some of India's worst rioting. It's reported that up to 2,000 people were killed, mostly Muslims, as Hindu mobs went on the rampage. It followed an attack on a train in which 59 Hindu pilgrims had been killed. Human rights organizations claimed the mobs had been stirred up by the politics of Hindu nationalism. On the outskirts of Delhi, thousands have come to honor the late M.S. Gowalka, one of the original leaders of the RSS, a Hindu nationalist group. The RSS believes the country should be a Hindu state, claiming that all Indians are Hindu in origin, regardless of their current religion. The uniforms may look Boy Scout, but Gowalka was an admirer of Hitler in 1930s Germany and said India could learn from his ideas of racial and cultural purity. After the Gujarat riots, today's leaders stated that the safety of Muslims lies in the goodwill of the majority. But they deny being anti-Muslim. Today's speeches praise Hinduism and use coded language without identifying the enemy. The idea of a Hindu nation has entered the mainstream of Indian politics. The RSS has close links with the former party of government, the BJP. Up on that stage is the man who was prime minister up until a couple of years ago, his former home minister, and an ex-vice president. This is not a fringe meeting. The former prime minister, A.B. Vajpayee, recited an inspirational poem. 
क्षणिक जीत में दीर्घहार में जीवन के शत शत आकर्षक अरमानों को दलना होगा कदम मिलाकर चलना होगा As I left the rally, some of the younger supporters were certainly fired up. It's a charming chance. Um, when the nation calls, we will go with a blessing of bullets. <laughs> Hindu nationalists no longer run the country. But they still wield considerable influence, and their views leave many Muslims unsure of their place in the new India. Many of them feel it fuels anti-Muslim prejudice. <laughs> Mumbai has a large Muslim population, more than one in six. Many live in poorer areas of the city and struggle to join the new booming India. Wasim Tanka is a commerce graduate. Despite his degree, he works in his father's corner shop, unable to get the job he studied for. My dream job was to be an accountant, but um, I didn't get that opportunity. So to earn my livelihood, I uh, carry on with my uh, father's job. Why do you think you didn't get a job? Due to discrimination. If it won't mean any, any discrimination, I would have got to get the job. Simple thing. Do you think there's a lot of discrimination? Yeah, there is a lot of discrimination, and it affects all the people here. Yeah. Wasim feels that Hindus discriminate against him because of his obviously Muslim appearance, the way he dresses, and his beard. When I go for a job, the person will tell that you will get the job, but you will have to remove your traditional dress. You will have to remove your beard. You will have also have to, you will you will have to come to the to the place working place um, like the other people. I get the people are coming. So why don't you do that? Because uh, the, these are the fundamental things which we have to follow in Islam. We won't leave these things for a job. You would rather be unemployed. Yeah, yeah, I will be. To lose your beard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will be either, rather unemployed. I will be. I will my find. I, I will find my earnings through other other source of work. Proving that Wasim has been discriminated against is inevitably impossible, but the point is he and millions like him feel that they are the victims of prejudice. <laughs> Muslims who do manage to get ahead come up against other barriers. Trying to buy a property in Mumbai's luxury housing market, for example, is pretty much impossible in some areas. Successful businessman Salim Awari has been attempting to buy a flat in this complex for the last four years. When I went there, very first day, they gave us a form. They asked us to write details, your name, telephone number and all, and they told us, okay, we will call you later. But they never called us. They, uh, uh, when I repeatedly called them, they said, first phase is over, we'll call you for second phase, then second phase was over, then third phase was over. So I think all, almost 1,100 flats they have sold out, and they never called us. Sometimes they, you know, directly uh, say, okay, we don't have space, and sometimes they say, okay, sorry, we don't give it to Muslims. They've said that to your face? Yes. How do you feel about what's happened to you? I feel very bad. I feel insulted. I feel humiliated. It's disgusting. I decided to take a look for myself, posing as an investor from London. One of my colleagues followed with a hidden camera. Another acted as translator. I wanted to know what kinds of people lived in the complex. The people who live here, they're nice. It's a, it's a good, good area. Yeah, he's dead. So, business managers. Professionals. The current government has faced up to the widespread discrimination being endured by India's Muslims and recently published a report detailing the abuses. Activists say it's time for action, and they're using street meetings like this 
to urge Muslims to stand up for their rights. India's founding fathers dreamed of a secular nation in which people of all faiths would flourish equally. It's a matter of growing concern that what has flourished is anti-Muslim discrimination. Deep down, Indian people are secularists to the core. Religion is important to them at another level. It does not impinge on their day-to-day -day relations with other human beings. How can you claim that people don't let religion affect their relationships with other people when this was a nation in which a million people died at its founding, there's been communal violence ever since, and there's still ongoing discrimination? Well, I agree that there have been occasional communal flashpots in the country, and I do not d doubt the fact that there are fringe elements in any society, in any country, that would want to exploit a situation that has happened in India. I went to the RSS Founders' Day rally where they were saying, India for the Hindus. What do you think of them? I can only condemn it. We never conceived of uh, India or Bharat as, uh, as an, an, an India where only the Hindus or people professing the Hindus faithful live. This is a country which for thousands of years have ensured a harmonious existence of people of all faiths and religions. And that is the India I would like to nurture. That's the India I would like to live in. In the big cities of India, hundreds of shopping malls have been built in the last five years. With the boom has come bigger salaries, and that's fueling a retail explosion. Time was your relatives would ask you to bring them something from Marks and Spencers when you came here. These days, if you've got the cash, you can get whatever you want right here in India. The new middle class are making the most of the economic boom. If you've got it, flaunt it. Do you spend a lot of money on clothes? A lot. A lot. She's the main oh, shopping God. champion. You're the big shopper. The economy is growing, there's more money. Yeah, that's why people are spending more. The stuff you get is all original. So you, for a brand conscious person, I think this is the best place to Do you think it shows India worshipping the god of materialism now? I don't remember God saying that I shall not go to a mall. <laughs> that wasn't part of the deal. <laughs> and why should it be? After all, this is a country where the god of good fortune is on sale inside the mall. Solid silver Lord Ganesha, over half a million rupees. That's around six and a half thousand pounds. And they've sold six of these in the last couple of months. The Hindu gods sit comfortably with the new consumerism, but there is a darker side to the religion. An age-old set of codes limits the ability of millions to share in the new prosperity. It's called the caste system. We're back in the nation's capital, New Delhi, now, but there's not much sign of New India here. We're in a poor end of town on our way to meet some of those who are absolutely at the bottom of society because this is one of the most hierarchical countries in the world, still defined by the caste system, the way Hindus have stratified themselves for thousands of years. Traditionally, every Hindu had his place in the social order. Each caste signified a profession, from priests at the top down to warriors, traders and farmers. Below them were the untouchables. These days, those at the bottom of the caste system are called Dalits. They used to be called untouchable because they did the worst jobs in society, and upper caste Hindus would refuse to have any physical contact with them. 
Satish Kumar cleans sewers and toilets. It's a grim task. Even among the Dalits, there is a hierarchy, and as a member of the Valmiki caste, he's among the lowest of the low. He was born into this job, his parents did it, it's been his family's role for generations. But why does it fall on you to do this work? If a Brahman or a other caste, he doesn't do this work. 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 He doesn't At India's independence, caste-based discrimination was outlawed. College places and public sector jobs were reserved for Dalits in a system of quotas and reservations. It's given them new opportunities beyond their traditional roles, but it's provoked a backlash too, and last summer, the issue turned explosive. <laughs> Government plans to extend the quotas to other low-caste Hindus, known as the other backward castes, led to mass demonstrations by upper-caste students. I met up with students involved in the protests at one of the prestigious Indian Institutes of Technology, or IITs, the powerhouses of India's high-tech revolution. The IITs in India are a dream for most of the science students at the school level. And with this new quota being introduced, the number of seats becomes very limited. We have our friends who couldn't make it and our brothers and, and really sisters hurt. People who really deserve to get into places like these simply could not because of the competition. The vast majority of people from lower castes still have terrible opportunities by comparison to most of you. Do you not feel that a positive discrimination is a good thing? The government simply does not do anything for the education of the, these backward classes at the younger level. The study pattern and the courses of study are not very easy. And you're saying there are students just not up to it? Exactly. But, but do you not see that all of you are from privileged backgrounds? And by, by virtue of your birth? I would like to say that... Had it been genuine upliftment of the poor or the uh, underprivileged caste, all of us would have been for it. Breaking down the injustices of the caste system will take generations. It's left millions like Satish feeling there's little hope for his future or for that of his children. Will your children end up doing this as well? <laughs> Upper caste students feel that having quotas and reservations increases prejudice against the lower castes. At the student level, it creates a kind of distinction. Amongst the students, there is this mentality, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but there is this mentality that a certain section of the students have come through a particular quota. And the mixing between the students is not of that level. So I'm it's created separation it within has the created, so it, Virtually, there is this you know, divide between the general category of students and the reserved category of students. Do you think it's reinforced the caste system? It has to a certain extent in trying to do away with it. Some Dalits have given up their Hindu faith in their desperation to find a way out of the injustice of the caste system. As Hindus, all these people here would have been condemned as Dalits, as untouchables. So their answer has been to find another religion. They've all converted to Buddhism, a religion that doesn't have a caste system. They believe it offers an end to the humiliation from the upper castes that's depicted on the walls of their temple. Hundreds of thousands of Dalits have converted to Buddhism in this way, but they're never truly able to escape the discrimination from some upper caste Hindus.
ये यहाँ जग हो रही यहाँ चला आया जो ब्राह्मणवादी हैं वो It's clear caste is still central to Indian society, however much the government attempts to tackle it. For even though people acknowledge discrimination is wrong, they still hold on to their caste identities, and that surely makes discrimination inevitable. You can see it in Indian newspapers, where there's not just a Lonely Hearts column, there's a whole section devoted to marriage partners. Just flick through the matrimonials in the Sunday newspapers. The front page may say cosmopolitan, and that's the ones where caste isn't an issue. But the vast majority of this section of the newspaper is all divided into individual castes and communities, from Brahmins to Kaiyas to Shatrias to the scheduled castes as well. And it really shows you just how ingrained caste still is in the modern India. Eradicating the effects of the caste system was a founding vision of this country. How much progress has been made? Caste continues to be a problem. A politics riven by caste consideration continues to be a challenge to our democracy. And I'm worried and I'm concerned. The fact is that thousands of years of civilization and history um, is confronting modern India. And, and in that interface, I hope that modern and progressive India will prevail, because that is where India's future lies. Large parts of the Indian population are being left out of this economic boom, though. How long before they see this new India? Well, the level of poverty has certainly decreased, which all statistics show. We have successfully uh, led to the progressive enlargement of the Indian middle class, which means that the lower strata has come up. However, there are a large number of people, at least 25% of our people, who still live in conditions of acute poverty. And that's really the challenge before the Indian nation state. But right now, the gap between the winners and losers in today's India is widening, leading to some extraordinary social divisions. I'm a couple of hours outside Mumbai right now, but it feels a million miles away from the rural India I've seen elsewhere. The roads are remarkably smooth, the cars remarkably fancy, and there are probably as many millionaires up here as there are in Chelsea. And I'm on my way to see what must be the ultimate escape. Ambi Valley is a huge gated community where the ultra-rich can protect themselves from the uglier realities of Indian life. This is a 10,000-acre site of exclusive homes, which, when completed, will form an entire self-contained city, and at a price that will keep all but the super-rich out. So how much are these properties? When we started this, uh, it was $1.8 million, but right now, uh, any waterfront property will be like $2.5 million. Beautifully designed villas. With average salaries in India so much lower than in the UK, that's like spending something like £40 million on a house. Incredibly, most of the plots have already been sold. I think my purchase was one of the fastest here. One of the fastest, yeah. I came here to spend one day, a couple of hours, and as I drove from the main gate to the reception, I decided to buy one. A massive outer wall surrounds the city, while a power fence provides additional security. What is the appeal of living in a gated community? I think it gives you a lot of sense of security. Teams of sniffer dogs and horse patrolling units maintain strict, disciplined, and highly motivated, unmatched security. We want this place to become as a city for the people, those who want to have this kind of life, you know. But this is so different to anything I've seen in India. Of course. It doesn't even feel like India. No, it doesn't. Is that good? I think it's brilliant. It's a country within a country. So I think we are doing something better than what you have in the UK. In a country that has for so long embraced hierarchy, Ambi Valley fits very comfortably. The rich and powerful can escape the poverty and despair facing so much of India and live in this, the fairy tale version.
My last encounter with booming India revealed its challenges in stark relief. Here in Mumbai was yet another building site for yet more high-tech businesses that are powering the economic boom. Building them are hundreds of migrant workers, unable to make a living in the countryside. These people are forced to live in squalor on site with their families. People like Sindabai. <laughs> Do you think your children will ever work in these call centers? I've spent a lot of this journey looking for the people left behind in this great Indian miracle. And the poverty has been shocking and the discrimination painful to witness at times. But I've had to keep reminding myself that the economic boom is very real. This is becoming one of the world's great powers. Indians will keep praying to their gods and goddesses. There isn't going to be a revolution here because they're used to living with contradictions. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. It's the rest of the world that's going to struggle to get its head around a superpower we'll probably never really understand.